Thank you, Jochen. And um, good morning, everybody. <coughs> I might be coughing. Don't worry, I'm not going to die yet. Uh, but this day will come one day. Um, as a first uh, uh, speaker here this morning, um, I will maybe do a bit of introduction. Uh, first, why does it matter why we talk about cyber defense? Who are the actors? I really will mostly concentrate and focus on the malicious state-to-state -state activities in cyberspace, because in my opinion, that is the most um, dangerous and most advanced one. Uh, what are the, uh, the myths in that regard, what we need to debunk? And uh, what we can do, uh, what we can do as nations, but also as an alliance uh, in NATO, and maybe more on the case of NATO. Um, first picture here, this is a, um, a hiking trail through the bog in Estonia. But basically it's here to say that, you know, to remind us all, why does it matter? It matters because we need to defend our way of life. You can picture whatever thing what you like here, and this is basically why it matters. It matters because uh, we have used to, for the last couple of decades, to talk about uh, cybersecurity as a uh, cybersecurity of computers. Nowadays, more and more, we should be talking about cybersecurity of everything because everything is becoming a computer. The um, uh, home devices, uh, thermostats, refrigerators, cars, aircraft, uh, there are people who basically say that we do not have really cars anymore. We have computers with wheels and we don't have aircraft, we have computers with wings. And of course everything that has a computer and is connected to anything uh, is possible to be hacked. Also even if it's not connected to anything. I do not know why people want to have a refrigerator which sends them email. Um, also can actually you know, participate in a, in a botnet activity, in a criminal world, taken over by the criminals, or is maybe spying on you. But unfortunately, this is basically where the world is going. All our critical infrastructure, more and more, is connected through the industrial control systems or SCADA systems. Um, and that basically means that we're not talking just about inconvenience of your beer being warm when you get home, uh, if someone has taken over a refrigerator, but actually that we do not have power because the power station has been uh, hacked. Um, usually, traditionally, they, um, uh, uh, and this is, you know, since 1970s, there have been uh, distinguished between three types of things what attackers in a cyberspace want to achieve. They either are going against the confidentiality of information, against the availability of information, or against the integrity of information. What we hear from radio, watch TV, and read, it's mostly about a, the confidentiality of information. You know, another company being hacked 500,000 or 500 million credentials, people's credit cards, so forth, have been, been put online. Um, I would say that this is a nuisance, but this is not life-threatening. So basically, if you're driving a car, and someone hacks your car, and tells the world where you are, it might be a nuisance if you want some privacy, but if they hack your car and turn the brakes off, meaning they attack both integrity of your information system and the availability of your information system, meaning brakes, then this is a totally different matter. The, um, this is a, a, a book just out a um, couple of months ago by Bruce Schneier. Uh, so basically, the title says it. It's actually on this theme what I just talked. I really highly recommend. The other classical way we distinguish basically actors in cyberspace, for malicious actors, people are talking about hackers, hacktivists, criminals, and then also nation states. Um, in terms of malicious activities uh, on cyberspace, most is crime. But I would say that the crime is not the most important, the most dangerous thing what we need to 
tackle with. We should be actually most concerned uh, by the nation state actors, by what are called in a geek language APTs, the uh, advanced persistent threat. Basically, nation state who has resources and time to breach, to take hold of information, to, if necessary, have an impact on the functionality of the information systems. So, uh, and, and, and basically, we're talking about different ways of influencing another country through the, the means basically carried through the internet. Um, <clears throat> there is an old saying that there are no borders in cyberspace. It's debatable whether this is really so. When you look at China, for example, and a great firewall of China. But <clears throat> I think one thing what I want to say very clearly is that even if there are no borders, there is clearly a geopolitics is still alive and kicking in cyberspace. If this type of event would have been um, organized in Seoul, in South Korea, it's going to be all about People's Republic of China and North Korea. Here, in this part of the world, we're mostly talking about Russia. If this event would be happening in Bahrain, we'll be all talking only about Iran. That basically means that cyberspace is influenced by geopolitics. This is, for example, uh, for your um, um, information, the uh, Russian malicious state uh, cyber actors. This specific picture is from the yearbook of Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service. So you can actually look it up if you Google. Uh, so it's online. You can find it online. Usually, um, when the cybersecurity companies identify uh, threat actors who belong to nation state, they refrain from naming countries. They usually put, uh, you know, a number, APT 28 or 29. So it's actually Russian FSB and, and GRU, two intelligence services. Uh, or they put a fancy name, like fancy beer, cozy beer, tsar team, and so forth. Uh, again, we are here, in all those cases, talking about Russian state-owned or state-controlled cyber actors. The <clears throat> who basically go back a long time. The first attacks uh, attributable to Soviet Union slash Russia were from 1986. Uh, the biggest one, uh, the big one was in 1998, a moonlight maze against the US military. Uh, in 2007, we saw a whole scale uh, attack against one nation state, my own, Estonia, for political purposes. The um, 2008, in a war against Georgia, Russia used the kinetic war efforts and a cyber war in conjunction, supporting each other. So basically, they integrated that into the uh, main <coughs> kinetic military effort. We have seen in 2015 and 2016 a, a Russian attacks against Ukrainian power grid, uh, basically affecting electricity, electricity supply. So basically attacks against the industrial control systems, against our basic utilities and needs. 2017, uh, uh, 2016, sorry, the um, uh, in, uh, influence operation or information warfare operation against the United States, interfering in election in the United States. I think the next panel, the second panel, will dwell uh, thoroughly into it. I'm not going to uh, say much more here. Besides the fact that, but for example, uh, there are two phases for that operation. First was basically hacking, espionage. That's quote unquote normal. All our countries have intelligence services we pay, and we want them to read other gentlemen's email. Uh, abnormal in state to state relations is when, if that information gained by espionage, is when used for information warfare needs or ends. 
And then 20, 2017, a uh, very important milestone when actually the destructive cyber attack was launched against Ukraine, the not Patriot attack by the Russian actors. Uh, and that went basically viral, went out. And of course, um, uh, close by uh, here, uh, Denmark's uh, Maersk shipping company was very hardly hit. Global damages from that destructive cyber attack were in the vicinity of 10, $10 billion. So this is a major thing. I want to caution though one thing, is that we should be distinguishing two things. One is the, the cyber attacks against the functionality of our systems. And another uh, is the attacks which are basically a means for the information warfare end. In Russian understanding of the world, information warfare or information de vaina is overriding principle and the cyber attacks are mostly in support of that. So basically that's what you saw, for example, in a DNC hack or in a hack of Sean Podesta's email. Next, my time is running horribly quickly. <clears throat> I need to um, speed up. And next I want to debunk three myths when it comes to state-to-state -state malicious activities in cyberspace. First myth is that there is no law. People say, well, you know, the international law does not cover that. It's wrong. Uh, the um, NATO heads and state and government in 2014, the summit in Wales, declared that existing international law, what we have, does apply to cyberspace. It doesn't matter which space we're talking about, law is the same. Including Geneva Conventions when you talk about law of war. Uh, EU's Bell law. Uh, the uh, NATO Cyber Center in Tallinn gathered together a group of 20 or so renowned international legal experts who went through the, the whole body of existing international law and came out with close to 700 pages of a legal text shifting through everything and basically uh, trying to make sense how does that existing international law, Lex Lata, apply in malicious cyber activities between nation states. By the way, it doesn't matter if the nation states say, well, this is a hacking group we don't know really. If you can prove that actually the state is in effective control of that group, the state is responsible for activities of that group. Second myth, what do we hear very often? People are saying, well, but attribution is very difficult. Attribution is impossible. How can you do that? Uh, it's not. It's a myth. Uh, attribution is hard. But if the attack is really um, ominous, what you have suffered, big countries, US in particular, is more than capable of attributing attacks, not just against countries or specific organizations or specific units, but specific people. This is from the FBI webpage. Uh, U.S. attorneys are indicting specific individuals, usually in China, Russia, or, not, or Iran, uh, pretty much regularly, you know, maybe once a month or two. Um, the problem with attribution is, first, is attribution lag. It takes time. So basically what happens is that you hit me in the face, I will go and analyze the situation for half a year, come back and say, you did it, and now I hit you back. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, I think a, a doing a coalition attribution, more countries together, is one of the tricks how to uh, solve it. For example, the NotPetya attack was attributed to Russia by, I think, seven different NATO countries, my own including. Also US, UK, and Denmark, which suffered the most from NATO <coughs> countries. Uh, the other problem with Attribution is that very often uh, your information, which gives you a good confidence that this country did it, might come from your own intelligence efforts, either human intelligence, cyber intelligence, SIGINT, or something else. And basically, you do not want to provide evidence because you will blow your operations. So basically, that's something, again, what you can do inside a coalition where you can actually share information which is very sensitive 
uh, in specific settings, but unfortunately this is not something that you can use in the public. Uh, and, and now I'm going over time, so basically just throw me out to organizers if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, re, uh, you know, eating into other people's uh, time too much. The third myth is that there is, that we are in a cyber war. Well-intending good people say that regularly. Uh, very good, solid US senators are saying that regularly. I think it's wrong. Um, it's wrong because, I mean, first, we haven't seen uh, people dying yet or things blown out. Uh, up in big numbers. Uh, one example we have had, that was a Stuxnet virus. They, uh, uh, they, uh, we have not seen people killed, and we are not in a state of war. Um, if we are in a state of war, then that would be a totally different war game. The gloves will be off, and our power stations will fail, our electricity grid will fail, our water purification systems might fail. So you might ask, why, for example, the New York Times reported that Russian digital fingerprints are all across U.S. power grid? It's not just for the fun of it. So it's, and this is what the Russians call a preparing the battlefield. There are two very different takes on where we are. One from Richard Clark, uh, which basically we are in cyber war, and another by Thomas Reed which basically I support very much what Thomas Reed is saying. Very wonderful book, maybe four or five years old, uh, but I think it's still relevant. Uh, or basically debunking this myth that we are in the cyber war. So um, what needs to be done? Um, individually, as an organization, as a nation state, and uh, international organizations. I'm not going to talk about individual cyber hygiene, you see that this is the reality. So people are saying, you know, please don't have a two-factor authentication on the devices, but actually the real problem already is here. You don't even uh, have to have a, a lot of brute force computing power to crack such kind of things. You can just try. <coughs> the, um, uh, so basically, Individual cyber hygiene organizations, there are people who know much more about that, can do their own, basically the, um, uh, uh, the, the processes. Nation states should do with their defense, cyber defense, search activities, and so forth. International organizations, I think we can train together, we can do collective attribution, and by the way, we can, I, may I remind you, go to war because one of us, one of the NATO nations, has suffered a devastating cyber attack. I'm not, I do not have time to show you a video. It's a three minute video in YouTube, but please check it out. It's called Locked Shields 2017 Execution or 2018 Execution. Locked Shields. This is basically the um, largest, most complex international cyber defense exercise hosted in Tallinn, Estonia by NATO CCDCO in NATO Cyber Center. Last year, there were 22 teams participating, 4,000 virtual machines in the cyber range, uh, including, for example, Power Grid, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, by Siemens, the Ericsson Network Systems, PLCs, so programmable logic controllers. We're working in 2017, we had, for example, Air Command and Control System and so forth. Water purification was also one part part of the game. So basically, locked shields, 2017 execution, 2018 execution. NATO. <coughs> um, probably sorry I'm going over time. Uh, NATO has agreed that, first, international law applies in cyberspace. Second, we can all go to war, kinetic war, because one of us has suffered a cyber attack. NATO, his state and government have agreed that uh, uh, cyberspace is a domain of operations for NATO where we will defend ourselves as we do on, in the domains of the air, land, and sea. So basically, it's another war fighting domain. So I would put it to summarize that we're not in cyber war, but in the future, any war will be waged also in cyberspace. It's going to be one part of a war waste in cyberspace. 
I'll give you one example, and those are the last couple of slides. The, um, what happened with air power? This is an Italian pilot, Giulio Gavotti, who on the 1st of November 1911 became the first person to do aerial bombardment. He threw two hand grenades overboard his aircraft, not this, this one, nicer one, uh, over the Turkish camp in nowadays Libya. Uh, that did not kill anybody, but that was basically the beginning of the air power. And this is flash forward to 1945. This is a, um, a German city of Wiesel. This is basically, just consider how quickly from 1911 to 1945 air power changed the warfare. Basically, by that time, countries were going against the center of gravity of each other uh, with air power. This will also happen with a cyber power. It's not a magic bullet, as the Air Forces was not. We still have navies and we still have armies, but it's an integ integral part of warfare in the future. So basically, um, it does not replace soldiers on the ground or sailors at the sea, but <coughs> um, we will need to look in the future, basically what type of warriors are we going to need in the future of our warfare? What type of weapons are we going to need in the new type of warfare? And what type of war stories will the grandpas tell the grandkids in front of a fireplace? And a <clears throat> I would say that there are so many things that I was not able to cover, but here are the covers of, some, uh, uh, of my favorite magazine, which basically has been dealing with the fusion computing and chip wars and, and so forth, and data, quantum computing, and the artificial intelligence and everything else. But time is running out or has run out. Thank you very much.